Welcome to Mind Love, episode 38. Today's episode is all about channeling your spirit guides. I expect a level of phenomena, and I know that there is spirit present even when I don't want to. Turn up your frequency with Mind Love. Bite-sized brain hacks for seekers, dreamers, and doers. It's time to give your mind a little love with your host, Melissa Monti. First off, Mind Love is now a CastBox original. CastBox is the fastest growing, highest rated podcast app on both iOS and Android, where you can get all of your favorite podcasts. It has a super clean layout and you can create playlists and download episodes to play offline. It's my personal favorite and where I listen to all of my podcasts. Don't worry, you can still listen to Mind Love wherever you get your podcasts, but I hope you'll give CastBox a try. Second, don't forget to subscribe on whatever podcast platform you're listening on and leave a review if you can. Reviews really help to entice more amazing guests. Plus, it helps me grow the show, which ultimately helps me give more value to you guys. When I first started Mind Love, I wrote a bucket list of people I wanted to bring on my show. And no joke, this person that we have today was the very top of my list. I've read five of his books, I have the sixth on pre-order, and will continue to read every single book he puts out until I die. And I don't think I've read more than three books by the same author, well, since I started adulting. Let's be real, who didn't spend elementary school with their nose buried in either R.L. Stein's Goosebumps series or Judy Bloom? What really makes this guest special is he didn't just write these books, he channeled them. He spoke the text aloud, which was then transcribed with no editing. And for those of you calling bullshit, he did the last two in front of a live audience. Today's guest is Paul Selig, psychic and award-winning author of five channeled texts so far. I have both physical copies of some of his books and audible versions of all of them, which I highly recommend because there's just something majestic about his voice. When people ask me which books have transformed me the most, I always send them to Paul Selig books. I've never read something and been so sure that it's absolute truth until these books. So just a forewarning, I might go full on fangirl. Sorry, not sorry. So today, three key things we'll learn are how Paul activated a spiritual awakening that left him clairvoyant, which behaviors may block spiritual channeling, and what Paul sees as the most important teachings he's channeled so far. And at the end of the show, I'm going to share a special exercise that I learned at one of Paul Selig's in-person workshops. This exercise is really cool for uncovering your true self. There are a lot of aspects about each and every one of us that we've claimed, but it's not really who we are. And this exercise will help us identify those things so we can let go of what's no longer serving us to make more room for who we really want to be. Before we dive in, I want to invite you to sign up for the Morning Mind Love. You'll get short daily reminders of your own beauty, worth, and power so you can start each day with a positive mindset and keep your vibes up between episodes. To sign up, visit mindlove.com and sign up right there on the homepage. You'll get some amazing free gifts when you do. First, you'll get our exclusive Powerless booklet, which is an awesome free booklet based on proven principles from the most successful people and some of our favorite guests. Plus, you'll get a free guided affirmation meditation set at the Miracle Tone, which is known to help attract love, health, and abundance into your life. The layered affirmations perfectly tune your frequency for personal transformation. So be sure to head to mindlove.com to sign up. Or if you're out and about, just text the word MORNING to 444-999. That's MORNING to 444-999. I'm so grateful for your patience, but I got to tell you one last thing. I kind of hate bras. They're just overpriced and uncomfortable and the straps are always falling off my shoulders. So I've been living in sports bras for years. Sexy, I know. But I just ordered a new underwear set called Tomboy X and I couldn't have designed them better myself, especially the bralettes. Tomboy X is the perfect cross between cuteness, comfort, and practicality. And now we can finally stop wearing underwear with more frills than function. They have bikinis, briefs, boxer briefs, trunks and boy shorts, soft bras, and racerback bras. In everyday basic colors, fun seasonal prints, and brilliant colors. And every option comes in extra small to 4X. So no matter where you fall on the size or gender spectrum, Tomboy X offers amazing underwear that any body feels comfortable in. 
Go to tomboyx.com slash mind and check out their special bundles and pack pricing. And Mind Love listeners get an extra 15% off with code MIND. Again, code M-I-N-D for an extra 15% off. Ditch whatever you're wearing for a pair of Tomboy X underwear. Go to tomboyx.com slash mind. And now let's welcome Paul Selig to the show. Thanks for having me. Let's start with your story. You had a spiritual experience that left you clairvoyant. Tell me about that. Well, I assume it left me clairvoyant. I, I sort of tie the experience to to what happened after it, but I, I may never know. I mean, it was, I think, 1987, and I had just a few months earlier begun to open up to the possibility of a spiritual life, and that came really out of sheer necessity, not because... I was looking for one, but I got hit pretty hard with the fact that this could be very real, at least real for me. But I I was still questioning. And I heard that there was this thing happening that people were calling the harmonic convergence. I heard people were going to be waking up. So I thought, you know, well, if there is a God or something like a God or whatever you want to call God, why would it say no if you asked to be woken up? So I just sort of went up to the roof of the building that I lived in the night before this sort of foretold cosmic event. And um, I, I asked to be woken up. And I, I had a, a crystal and a mantra. Somebody had given me one of each, and I thought you needed those things. I was attached to the props at that stage. And, um, you know, I for all I know, I was hyperventilating up there. I really will never know what happened. I mean, it was an experience of energy moving through my body from sort of the base of my body up through the top of my head and, you know, sort of left me sort of frozen and rocking in this energy. And it lasted for a while and then it stopped. And, you know, people later said it sounded like a spontaneous Kundalini awakening or a Shakti Pa or a soul awakening. I heard, I don't know what it was. I may well have been hyperventilating up there. It was a, it was a Kundalini mantra that I was given, but I didn't even know what Kundalini was. Um, but after that, I started seeing little lights around people. Um, and you know, I had been raised an atheist. Um, and I, I think that I'm somebody who needed something evidential or palpable or real to me to allow me to trust and and go where I have gone. So that's, that's, that story. Were you ever able to get any insight as to why you I'm sure plenty of people have asked to be woken up as well and didn't have such profound results. I said, I mean, I really don't know what happened. It was profound for me. You know, it was profound for me. You know, looking back on it, who knows? You know, at the time I had no context for any of this stuff. Um, I will say that at that moment of my life, I was wide open. And I also didn't have any real spiritual baggage to carry. I had been raised without religion. So I went to this rooftop. It was up on a rooftop where it happened in a state of expectation and innocence. And I think perhaps that helped. I wasn't demanding anything. I was like basically just sort of saying, here I am, you know, here I am. Hello, you know, and and I, I feel like I got a hello back. And if it was induced by me in some way, I may never know that. I do know that the fruits of the experience for me were these little lights that started going off. And if that was just attached to the experience or happened to coincide with it through something else I may have been doing or waking up to without knowing it again, I may never know. The why me thing? You know, I I mean, I don't think about this a lot. When I was maybe five years old, I had an experience of some being hovering over my bed uh, and talking to me. And it was a beautiful being. I remember it was glowing, it was gold. And there were robes that were, were very intricately woven. And I remember this because I was watching this thing from my bedside and it was above me. So I remember seeing the robes. And then I remember floating up on the ceiling, watching myself in the bed, having this conversation. And it's the only out-of-body experience I've ever had in my life. And in retrospect, I think I was being told something then that perhaps was important because I never forgot it. And I don't really know what was said. And I may, again, never know. 
the guides that I work with have said that I agreed to this, you know, prior to birth, and perhaps I did. All I know is, I mean, I don't feel very special. I just show up. You know, I just show up for these things and these books and hope I can hear and hope that the, the transmission is clear and is accurate and is what is intended. I'm still befuddled and perplexed, but I, I don't think of myself as especially chosen or, or special. I think that would be a terrible trap for somebody or for somebody like me. And I've just never gone there. I think when I was first opening up, to some of my abilities when I was in my, my early 30s, when I began doing energy work, it gave me a sense of identity briefly at a time when I think I perhaps needed something to make me feel a bit special. But that's, some, that's a stage I think people pass through very quickly. I mean, if you get stuck there, I just think then you're, you're working as ego or with ego and, you know, in, a, in a primary way. And, and not just sort of showing up for what wants to transpire, which is how I perceive at least my role in this. So you started with experiencing these lights around people, but then it evolved into actually channeling the guides. Tell me about your experience with the guides and the first encounter with them. Well, you know, I call them the guides, and the only reason I call them the guides is because my ex, this is many years ago, and my ex found out that I could do this and suddenly knew that there was a captive psychic in the house he used to say, ask the guides this, ask the guides that. So that's why they're called the guides. The first thing that I ever heard clairaudiently was when I was 25 and I was sort of bottoming out in a in a hotel room in St. Paul. I had been a playwright. I was fresh out of Yale. I was working on an opera and I was really, everything sounded like it must be perfect from the outside, but it certainly wasn't. And I was sort of, you know, bottoming out in this hotel room and I, I started praying really for the first time. And I don't even know what I was praying for, you know, in retrospect. And three days later, you know, I, I woke up one morning and I asked myself what I could do for myself that day that was positive. And I heard a voice and it told me what to do. And I, I shockingly went and did it. And when I say that I heard a voice, people sometimes think that, you know, it's as if somebody's in the room speaking to me. And that's not my experience. My experience has always been a thought that blocks out all other thoughts that is not a thought that is, has been chosen. We've had a couple intuitives and psychics on the show, and they say a similar thing. But how did you actually know what it was the first time it was happening? Did somebody teach you? Uh, this is how it happened. I started a form of energy healing in my, I guess, late 20s, early 30s, because I was opening up as a clairvoyant and clairsentient. I didn't know, I didn't know what those things were. Somebody sent me to a healer, so I, I went to a healer for a while, then I studied. And after I studied, I was volunteering at a, a center that was providing services for people with life-challenging illness. It was the height of the AIDS epidemic. I was living in New York City. I still do. And it was a terrible, terrible time for many people. And... Um, I was volunteering at this place and I found that when I had my hands on people, I started accessing information for them. Again, it was the thought that would sort of interrupt all the mental chatter and burst through that wasn't a chosen thought. I usually didn't mean anything to me often. You know, I've got my hands on somebody's body and I hear say Camilla and I go, who's Camilla? And they go, that's my mother. And then boom, all this energy would move. And that was how it began. And then I started sitting in my apartment in a small group and then met actually on and off for about 18 years, the people who attended change. But I did a group for 18 years that nobody really knew about because you had to, you know, know somebody that knew me to come. It wasn't advertised. I was a college teacher and I wasn't looking to be known for anything else um, at that time. But the very first group that I held, I was expecting just to do energy work and the kind of stuff that I had been taught and believed in because somebody had taught it to me. And then all of a sudden, the very first group, I started getting instructions for the group. And that threw me. And that was the beginning of channeling. It wasn't a visual experience. At the very beginning, it used to feel like somebody had their lips pressed against my forehead and was literally imprinting the words. And then I would form the words with my mouth as it would come, which is, I think, how I got sort of stuck in this whisper repeat pattern of you know, how I deliver my 
channel information. I don't know. Sometimes that goes away, but it's a bit of a, a, a way that I, I've been known to work for, for many years. So, you know, that's what it was like. It wasn't, you see, when I first started doing this, I wasn't calling it channeling. I don't know if I even really believed in channeling all that much. Um, I was not a very good new ager and I'm still not. And I'm often a skeptic about many things. But I was very, very, very interested in the phenomena of energy that would come through when I worked. So I would sit in the group not to hear stuff, but to feel the energy that would come through. And we were all feeling it. So I'd be in this little group and all of a sudden I would hear everybody receive a hand on your forehead. And the whole group would go bang, you know, we'd, we'd all feel this thing. And the fact that the phenomena was consistent and palpable helped me to trust it. So I was always there for the energy, and that went on until about 2008. I quit smoking in 2008, which is when my, my abilities really changed. And the guides I worked with started to teach through me. They started to lecture in that little group. And all I knew I was, I was I was speaking more. I just knew that there was a lot more talk going on, but I was only there for the energy hookup because I loved it, and it was real. You know, It was palpable. When I do workshops, that same energy is present in, in increments through all these attunements that they offer. So I'm still there in a certain way for the phenomena, although I've begun to understand and trust after six books now that these guides have a whole lot to say, you know, and they seem to continue to say it each time I sit down and close my eyes. You said that it changed for you after you quit smoking. So do you believe that vices such as smoking and drinking inhibit your connection to spirit? In my case, absolutely. In my case, yes. I'm not going to speak for anybody else. My opening, I quit drinking and doing drugs when I was 25 entirely. I, I believe I have done, as many people do, anything humanly possible to desensitize oneself for much of my life. So the psychic stuff opened up when I started opening up when I was 25. And that was shocking to me. But I loved to smoke and I was a good smoker and I didn't think of it as advice. I thought of it as a, a vocation. You know, I was like a four pack a day guy. And the guides actually said one night in a group, you know, we want to keep working with you and we can't unless you deal with this. And the next day I just quit and I got help. I had an inhaler. I did everything one, one does. But I did a lot of energy work, too. And I stopped and I haven't looked back. And that was, you know, 10 years ago now. Um, but I don't I didn't realize how much that was inhibiting my abilities until it was out of my system. And what it was doing was suppressing, I feel, my nervous system. My nervous system, I feel, is how I'm sort of what, 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 how I work through. It's my, the sensitivity comes through that, you know, my ability to read and tune into other people. And, you know, I often, when I step into other people, I often start to look like them. I mean, there's this whole physical phenomena that seems to happen when I work that I, I can't explain. But that, you know, my clairsentience was was there when I first started healing in my in my late 20s, early 30s. And it was profound. Um, but when it came back, then I think it sort of diminished and I was ignoring that I was just channeling my little group every week. But in 2008, once I once my system started to clear up, everything changed and the book started coming. You know, everything changed. It's like, really, I think I've been like walking around with a gauze bandage around my eyes and all of a sudden it was off and I was like, whoa. So for me, it was important. And, you know, I still like to eat, which is my problem. And I love sugar, but it's bad for me. And I don't channel ever after I've had sugar because it's just another way to to check out of my body. You know what I mean? So so that's my story. It may not be somebody else's. I I know of mediums or psychics who can have a glass of wine and read and um, power to them. It's just not, not the way that I, I can work. I imagine that doing this energy work and your psychic abilities and channeling the guides can probably be exhausting. What does it feel like for you? It depends. You know, I mean, I was thinking about this. I'm they're, they're doing a new book through me now. They've just started about a month and a half ago. There are about 150 pages in, and they're doing it all publicly in front of different groups. 
And the energy that they're bringing through is very high and they're bringing through new attunements. And these days end. And, but, you know, I, I'm also odd. I'll like channel for five hours in a day. You know, most people I think that do this might be doing 20 minutes, 40 minutes. But I mean, I'm really in there for a long time. And when they're doing the books, there's an intensity of energy and specificity to the channeling, which is physically somewhat exhausting for me. I mean, when I end these days, I'm like, you know, I don't realize how rigid I've been until it's over. At times, I'm energized by the work that I do, and I feel great. And I think if I were just doing it, you know, an hour and a half a day, I'd be jumping around. But five hours of doing anything that involves mental work and involves utilization of your energy centers in the ways that I operate, you know, it, it can take a bit of a toll. So I don't complain about it. I mean, it just seems to be the way that I work. If I'm channeling and there's tremendous resistance in the room, like somebody who just ain't going to go there and is going to make sure that I know it, I can feel it. And then it's kind of like swimming against the current and I can become exhausted from it. Or the channeling can get a little shouty. It's almost like there's this effort to push. And the moment that person is gone, everything goes whoop right up and it's a joy. It's just like, you know, riding around in a hot air balloon, you know, after that. So, I mean, there, there are gradations and differences um, and frankly, each time I work, you know, I just seem to do it a lot. So I've been known to do, I work at the Esalen Institute a lot in Big Sur, and I'm often there channeling for seven days straight. You know, I did a month there. I channeled every day for 30 days, pretty much. It was crazy. So clearly I'm enjoying it. Otherwise, I wouldn't be showing up for it. But it is a bit of a workout. When I attended your workshop, it was incredible. When you started channeling some of the guides, I clearly heard different voices, almost like different accents coming through. Do you start to recognize these different feelings of spirit or how does that work? You know, when the accent comes through, when there's the, this one guy that seems to operate with this sort of loud, booming sort of British accent, Sometimes it sounds a little Welsh to me, sometimes a little Scottish. But what I notice more than anything else are the vocabulary changes, which are slight. You know, there's one guy that I hear that says deers. And that's the guy, that guy channeled the entirety, I think, of uh, the Book of Truth. And if you read that book, you'll say, you know, hello, deers. And I'm going, and I hate the word deers. You know, the, the British guide likes to talk about song and music, and it's there's a, a joyfulness to it. But those are the distinctions that I make. And once you see the whole thing typed up in transcript form, truthfully, it all seems the same. The cadence, the, the sentence structures are all com comparable. So clearly it's, it's a, you know, what they say is it's a group, it's a group energy. And, you know, I notice the distinctions. I know the one guy that I seem to have sort of a visual relationship to. And that's only because, you know, it's happened. I think if I were a good daily meditator, as my friends keep recommending I become, I'd have a lot more of that. But I understand the familiarity of the transmission. I understand the familiarity of the language and how the process that I work with seems to always be honored um, in a way that I can adjust to and be worked through well. So that's what my focus is, is how clear is the transmission is it what I'm used to hearing, not informationally, because the information changes, but the structure of the sentences, which is very different than my own sentence structure, as is the word choice. You know, the guides I work with say you and your fellows, and I've never said fellows <laughs> in my life, you know, so. Have you ever been channeling and something they said was just really surprising and you thought, what the hell are they talking about? All the time, especially recently, all the time. I have a friend, a wonderful old time medium named Jeanette Meek, who mentors me in some ways. She reminds me of things when I get worried. And she reminds me that, the, you know, the information's not for me personally. But I was reminded because I actually had an experience. I was doing a workshop just this last weekend in Madison, Wisconsin. And they're really teaching embodiment in a whole wild way. And, and I was like struggling one day and Jeanette reminded me, so, you know, Paul, you're trying to listen to the transmission. 
And I really can't be an effective channel if I'm listening too closely. Throughout my experience of doing this, I mean, I've always said it's like, I, you know, when I channel, it's like I'm turning the steering wheel over and I'm climbing into the back seat of the car. And from the back seat, I'm kind of listening, but it's removed. I'm not trying to drive, but occasionally I'll hear something that I find alarming or confusing. And then I pop up and I say, like, basically, hey, wait a minute. And then the guys say, Paul was interrupted. And then they'll often take my question. What they've been known to do in the last book or so is anticipate my question so that I don't interrupt the transmission, which was a smart thing because there's one book, I think the third book, where they actually had to reconceive an entire chapter because I kept interrupting so much. And they said, okay, Paul, we're gonna deal with your questions and we'll, we'll come back to what we had planned. And that's all in the book because the rule with all the books thus far has been nothing gets edited. I don't get to go back and take things out, you know? So if it's channeled in a session for the book, it's included. But for the most part, if they anticipate my question, they are anticipating the question that I was having, but they'll often phrase it in their own way. So they'll say, for example, Paul is interrupting and he asks, if I am about to cross the boulevard with my fellow, which is not my language at all, it's them sort of giving my, you know, parroting back the idea of my question in their way. But I think what that allows them to do is just continue the transmission without sort of an abrupt stop and break to take my question and to come back to the teaching. That still happens once in a while, but not as often. I guess after a couple channeled trilogies, they're getting just as used to working with you as you are to working with them. It's a little like that, yeah. I'm happy about that. I'm always very happy when they say, Paul has a question and we won't take it now. I love that because it reminds me that they're in charge and it's their book. You know what I mean? Like, Paul has a question, we'll address it later, or please let us continue, you know, this transmission. And I'm fine with that when it happens. I actually find it a bit of a relief. Um, after the fact, it almost always makes full, complete sense. But, you know, I hear things in phrases. You know, it's like phrase, 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 phrase. I don't know the whole thought. I don't know the whole chapter. I certainly don't know the whole book, you know, as it's coming out. I hear... I hear it a line at a time, not even a full sense, often a fragment of a sentence at a time, one on top of the other. So very often what might have been confusing to me was perfectly well explained earlier or is about to be explained, you know, and I just have to get out of the way. Out of any of the books I've ever read, your books have left me feeling the most transformed. They're just so powerful. How do you feel like you have evolved during this whole process? It's hard for me to say. I, I'm living a very different life than I used to live in many ways. You know, I was a full-time academic. I had a, a full-time teaching job at NYU that I'd had for 25 years. I was also running a graduate program at a small college in Vermont. And I was doing this stuff some, somewhat as a hobby until the book started. I, mean, I wasn't expecting a book to come out. I didn't know there was a book until two days before they started dictating it. And it took two weeks, two and a half weeks. And I said, it'll take two weeks, took two and a half weeks because I took two days off. And since then, it's been basically nonstop. I'm less frightened than I was. I, it's so hard to explain because I don't see the changes. My friends certainly do. I mean, my abilities have transformed, you know, what I can do and how I operate. I didn't know that I was a medium until I started. Now I'm a medium for the living, which is an odd thing to be. So if you know, you're not talking to your sister and you give me your name, I can step into your sister. I may even start to resemble her and then hear what's going on between those. Like I'm a switchboard. I just go between people and I get all this information. I mean, I didn't know any of this stuff. This wasn't, you know, what I came from at all. So how has it changed my life? I expect a level of phenomena, and I know that there is spirit present even when I don't want to. So, you know, it's, it's just a different way of being in the world. That's the easiest way that I can describe it. I'm curious about the difference between channeling the guides and channeling the living. Does it feel different? Yeah, it's very different. I, I explain it this way. It's like I'm a radio, you know. So if I'm channeling the guides... The, the station that I'm tuned into is the guides, and that's the broadcast. 
and it's a consistent broadcast. If I'm channeling, and I don't call it channeling the living, um, although it's other people have called it that, I call it stepping in or tuning in. If I tune into you and I'll, I'll ask for your name, you know, your name becomes the radio station coordinate that I go to. So if I tune into you, I'm hearing you at a higher level. And if you want to know about your sister, I do a, go to you first and then I go to your sister to move to the dynamic that exists between you. She becomes the radio station that I tune into. And then I just switch channels back and forth and to hear what's going on. I and mean, if the guides want to come in, they'll come in with their commentary. That's the best way that I can describe it. I mean, it's it's just an, another way of being present, I suppose. I don't think of it anymore as odd or strange, although I know it is and looks that way, but it's just a, a normal part of my life now. But channeling, the big distinction I feel is that in channeling, there's no interpretation. The words that come through are the words that I get, which is why I don't change the transcripts. You know, um, I think maybe there were three words that were adjusted in the last book, and that's usually because I mispronounced. I was speaking so fast, you know, or I I assumed a word because the beginning sounded like something, and I ended it, and then the guides will correct it. But like three words out of you know however many thousands and thousands of words in a book. Channeling is about rendering clearly and completely the teaching that comes through. When I'm reading, I'm interpreting, and there's a big difference between the two. So if I'm tuning into you, if I tune into you and all of a sudden I do that. Listeners, I know you can't see him, but he's got his fists up like he's ready to punch someone. Because the first thing that I'll usually get is a physical posture like that. That usually means you're ready to fight. You're defending against something. And I have to interpret what this means to understand. And I remember once I was reading for some recently I was at Esalen and I was reading for some guy and I tuned in and I bent over and I did that. And I said, I don't know what this means. He said, I do. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a skier. And so I was him skiing. And that was part of what he needed to, to hear about. Do you understand this? So I don't I often don't know what it means. I know that I do it. But the interpretation is. I see something, I have to try to understand what it means. It's often very literal. I remember once when I was first reading, I was reading for some woman who was fighting with her whole family. It was a real Jerry Springer mess, you know, but it was like everybody it was like the hat, everybody was the Hatfields and McCoys. It was a, and during this whole reading, I kept seeing this giant spool of uh, this cable spool, you know, those great big wooden things where you roll cable out on. I'm seeing this thing and I'm there, Mr. New Ager, you know, going, what does that mean? Cables, connections, things underground, round things. I didn't know what the hell it meant. And I didn't say anything. And at the end of the reading, I said, I don't know why I, I'm seeing this, but I've been seeing this big cable spool through this entire reading. And the woman said, well, that's what we've been fighting about, the cable bill. They charged $700 worth of movies on my account. I was like, what? So cable, it was a literal thing. The spirit was giving me cable. All I had to do was say cable, and I was looking for more meaning. And, you know, as, as I've been told, you know, the reading is not for me. It's for the person who's getting the reading. And I don't even have to understand it. It's not up to me. It's not for me. It's for them. True story, the other day I was noticing how great my skin looked and my husband asked what was different. I told him I'm using this new skincare line by Beauty by Design because they sponsored Mind Love. And honestly, this is the best my skin has ever looked. There is a noticeable difference. Plus, the entire buying experience was just superior. First, skincare is hard to shop for. You can't just try it on and see if it fits like you can clothes or even makeup. You have to date it for a while before you know if you love it. Then there's navigating all the options and making sure the ingredients are clean. But with Beauty by Design, all I had to do was fill out this easy online quiz that asked me about my current skin issues and what's important to me when it comes to my skincare. Then I actually took a picture of my skin and a real esthetician checked it out and basically prescribed me my skincare. And they work with your budget. To get 20% off your first order and free shipping, go to beautybydesign.com slash mindlove and use mindlove at checkout. For 20% off your first order and free shipping, go to beautybydesign.com slash mindlove and use mindlove at checkout. 
I have been gradually converting to all natural non-toxic products over the last few years. And one of my highest priorities was deodorant. But the problem is a lot of the natural ones just don't work that well or they're messy to put on. But I finally found a safe aluminum-free deodorant that changed the game for me. Kapari. Kapari's coconut deodorant is aluminum-free and it actually doesn't suck. It doesn't plug your sweat glands and it takes care of any smell without messing with your body's natural patterns. But most importantly, it works. It fights odor with plant-based actives like sage oil and coconut oil. And it outlasts even your longest days. It's gotten love from editors at Cosmo and People, and you can check the thousands of five-star reviews on Kapari's website. It's Kapari's number one selling product. They can barely keep it in stock. Kapari's deodorant doesn't leave behind a sticky white residue either, just that sweet, subtle scent of fresh coconut milk. It's also free of silicones, sulfates, parabens, GMOs, and baking soda, so it's perfect for sensitive skin. So knowing there's a safe, clean option out there that works just as well and smells amazing, why wouldn't you want to try it? Kapari even offers a money-back guarantee, so there's really no reason not to. So say aloha to Kapari. Go to kapari.com slash mindlove to make the safe switch today and get $5 off your first order. That's kapari.com slash mindlove. Kapari.com slash mindlove. I attended one of Paul Selig's workshops in February, and I was lucky enough to have him read me. I had just launched Mind Love about two and a half months before, so I was super pumped up, but also still kind of flying by the seat of my pants. He was taking questions, and everyone's hands shot up, and he picked me. I had one question, and I asked him, what do I need to do to take my life to the next level? Am I even on the right track? Like he said earlier in this interview, he kind of takes on the characteristics of people when he, as he says, goes to them for the answers. So he came to me for this, and he put his hands up and shrugged his shoulders, kind of like the I don't know emoji. And he tilted his head back and forth, and he said, you're kind of funny. You're like, maybe this, maybe that, could be this, could be that. And then he asked the guides to weigh in, and they said, stop do, do, doing, and start be be being. To be honest, when he first said it, I was like, really, that's it? But the longer I've sat with it, the more it means to me. And it's something that I've now totally taken to heart. We don't get our worth from how much we get done. We are born worthy. We're already enough, even without doing anything. We're all made from the same stuff. The universe is inside each one of us. We all embody love, truth, universal intelligence, source, God, whatever you want to call it. We're just at different points in our journey of remembering who we truly are. The best thing that you can do for anyone is to stay on that path of remembering your own power, your own essence, because by shining your light, you shine the way for everyone else. So the next time you're worried about letting people down, You're not doing enough for your kids, for your spouse, for your parents, your friends, yourself. Stop trying to do and just be. Feel into your own essence. Sit with your own energy. Quiet your mind and be love. You're responsible for the energy you bring. So bring the kind of energy that you want to spread. Going back to your experience channeling the very first book, my personal favorite, I Am The Word, legend has it (laughs) that the guides told you to take the first deal that comes your way and don't negotiate price. How'd that go down? Side note, listeners, there is a siren in Paul's background in this response, so if you're driving right now, you are not getting pulled over, unless you are. (laughs) Victoria Nelson, who is a wonderful writer and academic, was on the phone she was in Berkeley, California. I was in New York for the first few books. I, I need an active listener when I'm channeling. I can't just channel with myself in the room or into a recorder. Now the books are done in front of a full audience, and that's even better because there's a video record of it. But Vicky was there, and the guide said, you know, it's going to be published. They said it's going to be the first publisher who reads the book. Small metaphysical press, don't haggle. That's what I heard, don't haggle. Shortly thereafter, I was invited to channel at the Esalen Institute for the first time at a conference before 
a bunch of eggheads. It was really, it was an invitational conference. I think my roommate there was the former head of the, the secret spying program for the CIA and, Jacques Belay, the UFOologist, was there, and um, and among the people there was Mitch Horowitz, who was the editor in chief of, of Tartar Penguin at that time, which is a small metaphysical press, but it was under the umbrella of, of Penguin Books. I had brought the manuscript for I Am the Word that had just come off the press at Kinko's the day before. I mean, I took it there the night before to have it in my suitcase, and I brought it there, and Mitch took the manuscript home with him. On the plane, he asked if he could take a copy. And I think he wrote me from the airplane and said, this is really very interesting. And then shortly after he landed, maybe the next day or something, he said, when can you come into the office? And the book was on the shelves eight months later. It was never submitted to a publisher. And I didn't haggle. I think I think I was paid $5,000. I think that was what I was paid for. I am the word. And I knew not. And, you know, I was grateful for it, truthfully was a lesson in trust and everything around this work, the guide's work has truthfully been taken care of. I don't have to do too much. You know, all I have to do is continue to be willing to show up and do my part. But they've been careful to bring the, the people who can support the work. And they've been wonderful people. I've been very fortunate. What has it been like as you become more well known as a public figure, especially since you didn't ask for any of this? I was a college teacher for a long time. I'm used to sitting in front of a group of students and teaching. It's a place that I'm comfortable as Paul. I've also been shy much of my adult life. And reserve, And people, people mistake the shyness for reserve. I find it a bit challenging. Unless you are into this stuff, it's highly unlikely that you know me or know what I do or would encounter my work. So, you know, I mean, there have been odd a few odd periods where I've been stopped by people. I walked into a store once. It was an antique store, and these two guys started jumping up and down and pointing. And it turned out that I'd just been watching one of my videos or something on YouTube, so they were all excited. And I was, I was, I thought that was really sweet. You know, I'm, I'm so not used to that. But I'm private too, and I have, I think, a somewhat uncomfortable relationship with the idea of being public. I do it for the work. I don't really have a need. I don't think to be seen as doing this, I do it, you know, and I do it because, pardon me, it's what I'm called to do now for whatever reasons, you know, just as I felt called to be in an NYU classroom for many years. I mean, my spiritual, my spiritual practice for 25 years was teaching college. I loved it. So this is what I do now. When we were talking about your spiritual awakening and I asked why you, you said that maybe it's because you didn't have any religious baggage to start with. So now, obviously, your views on spirituality are totally different from those that you were raised with. What does your family think now? There's only two of us. My mother, you know, who's well on in years, and um, my younger brother. And they're both supportive of it. I think, you know, they knew, sort of, that I was into this stuff for a long time, but I don't think they gave it any credence. They still thought of me as somebody who was teaching college and perhaps should be writing more plays because I really didn't do all that much of that in the last few years. When the first book came out, I Am the Word, I think they both had to sort of reassess who I was and what I did. And certainly as The books have grown in popularity and they've kept coming since 2009. I think there's now, you know, six. The newest one's coming out in November, which is the Book of Freedom. And now they're delivering another one. And there's two more to come after that that I've agreed to. So, you know, I think they've had to adjust. There's been support. My mother professes not to be able to really understand the books. I think it's challenging for her. My brother, I think, finally read the first book very recently, and he sent me a lovely email, which I was very touched by, that he took the time with it and that he found it meaningful. But, you know, I'm not the author of the books. I don't have that kind of relationship to the content. When I was a playwright, it really meant a lot to me if you like the work, you know, and my my ego was really invested And here, I perceive myself as a collaborator because I don't think the books could come through without my participation. 
but I don't feel that I'm the author at all. In some ways, the stenographer or the spoke, the radio, I'm the radio. You know, my voice is used. I have friends that will never read these books and dear friends who will never read these books. And I love them dearly. And I'm not in the least bit offended <laughs> that they haven't read the book because it's not like I didn't write it. You really can't critique the writing. These books weren't even written. They were spoken, all of them spoken verbally and then transcribed. There's no typing. There was transcribing of the recordings. And I did the first four, I think myself and I hope I never have to do it again because it's exhausting it takes longer to type and you get so sick of hearing your own voice when you have to get everything perfectly on these recordings there's a wonderful woman who's been transcribing the last two books and she's working with a new one and she does the live streams and I'm enormously grateful because now I actually get to read them I'm not so sick of them when I see them because I don't remember what I said so I look, I look at the chapter from last week and go, wow that's really interesting and I always look at everything to see that it makes sense, because as I'm dictating it, I don't know if there's a run on sentence that just never ends. Mostly it all has made sense. Once in a while, there's a misplaced comma, you know, or a period, and it all makes sense once the period's inserted. But um, it's a verbal dictation. Do you have a favorite book of the ones you've channeled or one that stands out to you the most? I don't know anymore. I, I used to say the book of knowing and worth was my favorite, but I think it was my favorite at the time because it was a very delicate transmission. And also it was the first time there was really one teaching that was on one theme. The first two books covered a lot of territory. The first book, I Am the Word, in retrospect, seems to hold the DNA of all of the books that have followed. It's the basis for all of them. The Book of Truth is a really challenging book, but the dictation for it was so careful, so specific. I mean, every time I sat down for a session, I literally felt like somebody was reading a book to me that had already been written. It was like every every pause. I mean, it's like so, so clear. And the, the two that have followed in mean, the Book of Freedom, and um, the one that's coming now, it's not that they're not as careful, but they're being done publicly. And because I'm doing them in workshops, I'm always braced for when they're going to deliver something, which is a little nerve wracking, because they might do a lecture and they'll say, and this is not in the book. And I go, oh, thank God, you know, and then I'll do another lecture. And I'm going, is this in the book? And they'll say, yes, Paul, this is in the text. But I don't know it until it comes. And in the old days, I would just get on the phone in my office or in my apartment, wherever I was working to Victoria with all of these different recorders on in case something failed, you know, but then they started taking advantage of the fact that I'm working publicly and now they work publicly, which is actually great fun for the students because they're there as the books are being delivered, you know, they're participatory to it. There's a quote in the Book of Truth that really resonated with me, especially during this journey with the Mind Love podcast. It says that asking, what am I to learn, puts you in a position of humility and authority in any instance. It's a great mantra before interviews, and in daily life, it's also a great reminder that everyone has something to teach me. Is there a teaching or message that's come through that has meant the most to you? Yeah, that's still the best that the action of fear is to claim more fear and that every choice you make in fear gets you more fear. That's, I think, helped me the most because I can do that. And it's a very simple act that I can follow. You can't be the light and hold another in darkness. What you damn damns you back. I mean, it's the simple things that I tend to remember. The idea that it's the true self or what they call the divine self who claims truth and not the personality structure is imperative to the teaching because we misidentify, I think, with the personality structure when in fact the guides say we're something vastly more. And their teaching is very much about the realization of that part of who we are. So that continues to be important to me because I continue to understand it, grapple with it, reject it, fight it, embrace it, all those things as I go through my own process with this material. So you've already said that you've agreed to several more books coming up. 
as a psychic, do you have any insight of what else will come of your life or is it just unfolding as you go? No, I don't get that information. I really don't. I have this small self. All I can say, and I want a partner. I want to own a house someday. It's quiet. I live in New York City. It's like I want to go someplace quiet and relax when I'm not traveling. You know, I have these sort of small things. But the big picture for this work, I don't know it. And I, I think I'm kind of glad that I don't. My strong sense and some memory is that I've, I've had encounters with this kind of work in prior incarnations that haven't always ended up terribly well. So I'm hoping in this one that we, you know, that, that it's all good and I have to trust that it is. So channeling and even channeling books are not new things. Two of the most famous that come to mind are A Course in Miracles, which was channeled by Helen Shuckman. She says that it had been dictated to her word for word via inner dictation, which came from Jesus of Nazareth. And then another one that a lot of listeners might know is Abraham Hicks, which is actually a woman named Esther Hicks, who says that the Law of Attraction series was translated from a group of non-physical entities called Abraham. Do the guides ever comment on any of these other channeled texts? No, they haven't. I I don't read anybody else. I think I read half a Seth book when I was a grad student. And that's many years ago. And I thought it was fascinating, but I was too busy partying in those days to finish it. In the very first book, there's a comment where the guides say this is not a book that's been written before. And then they say this is not A Course in Miracles. And people have often said, well, why are your guides referencing the course? You know, are they dismissing the course? And in fact, I mean, this was in the very first day of dictation, I think. The guide said, this is not a book that's been written before. And I piped in in the background, oh, yeah, what about A Course in Miracles? And they said, this is not A Course in Miracles. Now they would say, Paul is asking. They would have framed it. But this was as we were just beginning this ongoing courtship. So, no, I don't hear that. You know, I really they don't. They don't compare. People often ask me to compare things. And I say, I can't. I don't read other people. You know, and I do that intentionally. My feeling is, is that the integrity of the channel is important, that you don't go back and fix it up and make it be what you want. I tend to be a little wary of people that are channeling current events with a lens that feels a little bit more from the psychic realm than the higher realms to me especially when there's a political bias. And my guides, I don't think, could care less. They, they speak in larger gestures. They don't name names, or they haven't thus far. They're teachers. My guides are teachers. They're not there to appeal to the need for immediate information in the zeitgeist. At least that's not my experience of them. And that's not to say that other people can't do that. It's just not what I get. There's a very big thing that I do believe. The guides that I work with don't teach fear. They're, they don't teach fear. And whenever I hear of a channeling or I pass one on social media that seems to be fear-based or inciting fear or inciting separation or asking people to act in opposition to others in, 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 in negative ways, I, I tend to be wary of, of the source of the transmission. But that's Paul. You know, my guides, again, they don't have comment. Thank you for that. The differentiation or even the interaction between you, Paul, and the guides has always been such an interesting aspect of the teachings for me. For listeners who are interested in learning more about you and the teachings of the guides and your books, where can they find you online? My website, Paul Selig, P-A-U-L-S-E-L-I-G dot com. That's the place to start. The books are available at all the, the major booksellers. You can get them online. But the website's the best way, and there's a calendar. I, I travel a lot, and I do a lot of workshops, and I'm channeling every Wednesday night just about online. There's an, a live stream that we've been doing for a few years, which is really the laboratory that used to meet in my apartment all those years ago. It's just now in a different forum, so it's where the teaching unfolds. But yeah, I'm, I'm not hard to find that way. I promised you guys an exercise that I got at the workshop I attended in February. I'm so glad I'm doing this episode because I'm looking back at my notes for the first time and there are just little tidbits that I wrote down when Paul was channeling the guides. Some of these quotes are the true self knows and the small self thinks. You cannot be a master and a victim at the same time. 
We choose physical pain as a way to release things here. Those were just a couple gold wisdom nuggets for you. But for the exercise, I wrote, be with myself that thinks I know who I am. Make a list of who I think I am. Always gets blamed, thinks they're unlovable, has to learn the hard way. In doing this, you will see the life that you live. In seeing this life, you can see how you can change. It's important to do this exercise to understand how much you have already claimed in this universe. And when your investment in this list changes, so does your world. So I challenge you to write down some of these things that you would use to describe yourself. The things you've said throughout your lifetime that, oh, this is just who I am. Then look over this list and release the things that aren't serving you. Once you release all of these untruths, you can claim your truth. If you're having a hard time finding your truth, sit in stillness and ask. Ask your highest self for information so that you don't have to rely on the old information. For all the links mentioned in this episode, including a link to Paul's books on Amazon, go to the show notes at mindlove.com slash 038. I also want to say thank you so much to anyone who left comments on CastBox or reviews on iTunes this week. My favorite comment of the week is from a listener named Kiki, who says, I've never listened to podcasts before and found Mind Love right away. I'm hooked on it now. I really enjoyed the topics, the guest speakers, and Melissa's energy. I also signed up for the morning Mind Love email and love opening them first thing in the AM. It's a great way to start my day. Thanks for enriching my podcast experience. I can't wait to listen to future episodes. Thank you so much, Kiki. I appreciate you so much and all my other listeners and all of you who have shared the podcast or told your friends, your support blows my mind every single day. So thanks for giving your mind a little love today and I'll see you next week. Thanks for tuning into your higher frequency with Mind Love. Head to mindlove.com for a free gift to keep your vibes up until next week. 